Good evening, my distinguished friend, the president of the IDC, Professor Uriel Reichmann, the chairman of the Hertzler Conference, Major General in Reserves, Amos Gilad. Oh boy, is he missing. I know he's doing a wonderful job here, but he's missing there because what he has done for our people in our state is uh, something that I wish here to express my appreciation for here and now, because it is, uh, I mean, it was definitely not something that should be taken for granted all those years of service. And now the mayor of Herzliya, Moshe Fadlon, the CEO of the President's Resident, Mr. Tubi, dear Mr. Ronen Hoffman, uh, the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. And I know that there's always a problem with us, so many distinguished guests. It's always a problem. I'm frightened that we're going to miss out and not mention their names. So uh, please forgive me if I have. In July 1992, the then Prime Minister, Itzhak Rabin, of blessed memory, said, In the last decade of the 20th century, once again, the atlases and geography books are once again drawing an updated landscape. Our duty, our duty towards ourselves and our children is to see the new world as it is now. We must join the journey of peace, reconciliation, and international cooperation, which is speeding across the entire planet. Because if not, we will remain lagging behind alone at the station. Thus said Itzhak Rabin. The feeling that the old world saturated with hostility was collapsing and a new world order was being forged, was shared by many. Then intellectual Franz Fukuyama published an article entitled The End of History and the Last Man, in which he claimed that we were witnessing not only the end of the Cold War, but the end of his story, history itself the overturning of the Western liberal democracy, he claimed, would be the end of universalism of human governance. In the years since then, more and more countries have even ostensibly turned to the democratic order. So it was in South Africa, wherein apartheid was repealed in 1994. So it was in Latin America and Eastern Europe and in other regions. The faith, the faith in liberal democracy and its power was strong and binding. And this faith continued to dictate to many of us our world perspective. For many of us, even when the world order seemed to be crumbling and cracking. Yes, crumbling and cracking. The rapid, accelerated technological advancement deepened that feeling because erroneously, many of us associated technological progress with moral and ethical progress. And so the internet and cell phones also symbolized a modern world, freedom of expression and very accessible information. The World Wide Web, that's what the, we were told, could never be obscured with iron screens. When the Arab Spring began to blossom in, the, in late 2010, there were those who saw it as a further testament that democracy can permeate even the difficult places, the most difficult places in the Middle East. The voice of the masses of the Arab citizens began to be heard against tyranny, oppression, backwardness, and ignorance. 
but in favor of representation, partnership, liberty, and freedom for women. Facebook and Twitter symbolize the revolution that began on their platforms, but reached the actual town squares themselves. There, in the space between the virtual debate and the town square, we saw the face of this promised democracy when it captivated the hearts of the entire Middle East. With that said, the wings of democracy have been weakened, with the exception of Tunisia. The Arab Spring brought with it great destruction, disappointment, and despair. The collapse of the old national regimes has led the Middle East into a state of chaos. A wave of radical terrorism has taken over this region, specifically led by the Islamic State, ISIS, that SELD has also sent its arms with a global reach. Half a million people have been killed in Syria alongside a mass of refugees who have lost their entire world and created a wave of immigration that has brought on a global crisis. When I met about a year ago with um, President Putin in Russia, he asked to speak about the rehabilitation of uh, Syria also, with the brokerage of uh, President Assad, I reminded him that he had warned us in 92 that the outcome of Saïs-Picot plans that we are now going to mention a hundred years since their signing will bring about non-natural states being established, non-homogeneous ones. He warned the world, and most specifically then, President Bush. And he said, look, Iraq, Syria, Libya can perhaps, will actually only run if they have dictators at their heads. Because if that is not the situation, and instead of that, you ask, to actually have democracies there, you won't find democracy. Instead of that, you will find what he described as what seems to be ISIS nowadays. In other words, when he came to explain that to us, that we could have new order in Syria, when the head of that state is slaughtering his people. These waves actually really have hit on the Western world, the end of history that was, was foreseen by Fukuyama has been turned on its head, and the democratic world is experiencing a severe identity crisis. All of the Western contra countries are facing the intensification of national, religious, ethnic separatism, and the widening and deepening of the rift between right and left. The walls have not fallen. Fences are being erected in Europe and will possibly even soon be built between the United States and Mexico. Britain is preparing for a complete disengagement from Europe, and there's even an intention to reduce America's free trade policy vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors and vis-a-vis -vis the Far East. In addition to all that, the public's trust in democracy is falling very sharply all over the world. The younger generation that was born in this millennium is already asking itself, why do we need these inherent issues? Yes, pondering and doubts. Distinguished guests, the foundation of these crises are embedded in a column, common element that we didn't really succeed in d discerning. In certain situations, this free, open society could be a real threat unto itself, God forbid. What I mean to say is that freedom of expression and the right to vote are perhaps necessary prerequisites for the growth of democracy, but they are not sufficient. Democracy cannot be built and is not built in one day. It must be accompanied by the building of strong state institutions and establishments. 
that place the rule of law above both the ruler and above public opinion together. My teacher and mentor, my dear, the friend of one of the, the historians of Israel, the Israel Prize Laureate Zvi Liavitz, taught us in the gymnasia when I was there about the failure of the first direct democracy, the Athenian democracy. This Athenian democracy of the town square did not survive. The next democratic experiment was in, experiment was in Rome, and after the, the destruction of the Roman Republic and the liquidation of it, democracy only resurfaced once again in the 18th century. Throughout history, democracy has undergone a long and protracted evolutionary process rectifying all its weaknesses. Thus, in the Roman Republic, they created the representative institutions, and in the Magna Carta during the Middle Ages, in the American Revolution and the French Revolution of the 18th century, they renewed rights and duties, checks and balances, and they were rectified in every generation. The architects of the political system seek to find ways to stabilize the dilapidated building itself that is democracy in order it will not collapse once again. Democracy was not and probably will not be something that can be taken for granted. It is true that the Facebook and Twitter revolutions have given a voice to the muted masses, the paralyzed one. No more government newspapers, newspapers will set the agenda. However, the enormous democratization of public discourse and social media has also created new types of demagoguery. If everyone is a journalist on his own accord, then the most respected newspaper is not preferable to the very last talkback writer. We wanted to hear everyone, and we got the post-truth era, which is called today fake news. We wanted to give a platform, but we heard solidarity. We wanted democracy, but we weakened it. When parties use social media mainly to humiliate, bash, and ridicule, instead of developing contact with the public, what kind of a democratic dream is it? I've said it in the past. And I repeat it today as well. Non-institutional democracy, a direct democracy, in which the will of the people at this moment overrides any other consideration is just a step away from anarchy. Anyone who has ever encountered the crowd knows how, that this, how a small event can quickly turn into a lynching and pogrom, literally. Distinguished guests, there will be no Jewish state if there's no democratic state. The picture of reality that I laid out before you concerns the roots of the Israeli existence. From here on, we must look at the unique global challenges that lie at the doorstep of Israeli democracy today. And they are three. First, the challenge in creating a representative democracy. In Israel, as in the rest of the Western world, institutions and leaderships must be strengthened. Woe to us if the state of Israel is defined entirely as the state of the will of the people. Woe to us if the Israeli Defense Forces become the army of the will of the people if the High Court rules its laws according to the constitution of the people's will, if we replace the Knesset with a referendum, we must strengthen the representative democratic institutions and their independence rather than weakening them. The second unique challenge is to create a base of agreement and to manage the relations between the four tribes, 
that comprise Israeli society and about which I spoke about here three years ago. They make Israeli society. We must act to increase the trust of all the tribes in the democratic institution. According to the Israeli Democracy Index, the Supreme Court has the trust of 60% of the general public compared to 6% of the ultra-Orthodox. The police gets the trust of 41% of the general public compared to 27% only of the Arab public. The ultra-Orthodox and the Arab communities make up 50% of the first graders today. Increasing the trust in the system of the various tribes goes hand in hand with determined action to promote their proper representation within it, whether in the judiciary bench or in the television studios or in the government offices. Representation is the first key to a sense of belonging and to shared responsibility. And finally, the third unique challenge is to preserve Jewish and democratic values in a state of protracted conflict. This is a conflict of 120 years because over time the Israeli-Palestinian conflict challenges the foundations of the Israeli democracy. The fierce dispute within the State of Israel is felt between right and left, between Arabs and Jews. There are challenges relating to the existence of Palestinian residents who are not citizens of Israel, residents of East Jerusalem, and the status of East Jerusalem altogether, which is uh, just a, a microcosmos of our capability to live together or forever to live under the sword. The Israeli security needs that place the Arab population, as well as our young men and women serving in the IDF, in difficult situations of friction between the populations, tension between values and freedoms. And this happens in airports, in checkpoints, in military operations. All these force us to be vigilant, to examine ourselves day in, day out, and to make sure that amidst the tension in which we live, we're doing everything possible to protect our security, as well as maintaining an uncompromising loyalty to ourselves and to our values as a Jewish and democratic state, democratic and Jewish. As in any place around the world, here as well, Israeli democracy cannot be taken for granted. The Jewish and democratic formula was and will remain the Zionist compass that guided us in the last 70 years, or maybe more, against the background of a changing world. And it will continue to guide our way in the future at any time and in every situation. Thank you very much for having invited me to come and give a speech in this very important conference. Bless all of you.